Hello, Hope Church family. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Yet again, Matthew chapter 7. As we are concluding the Sermon on the Mount, um, not entirely, but as we are wrapping up towards the end of Jesus' message to his followers. And again, I want to reiterate, more than likely, this was a message that Jesus preached uh, often. This was a message that he would preach to those who were coming out to see him. And he is explaining what it is to follow after him. But also remember that Jesus is constantly throughout the Sermon on the Mount and in just his ministry that we'll see as we continue through the book of Matthew and the other Gospels, he is constantly calling out hypocrisy. He is constantly calling out those who are pretending to be one thing on the outside, but on the inside they are fake. Or on the inside they have ulterior motives. Or uh, they, the point that we keep going back to over and over again, is their heart isn't where it's supposed to be. It's all about outward action, it's all about outward behavior, um, but their heart is not actually following Jesus. See, Jesus knows that the only true way for a human to change from who they are at the core of a sinful being is for their heart to be transformed by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talk about Romans 12, 1 and 2 all the time, and we think of it as being a living sacrifice, which is so important. But the proof or the way that we can tell if somebody is the Holy Spirit working in them as if they are being transformed. Not, it says, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, do not uh, become what it is around you, but rather have your heart transformed, starting on the inside through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming you, and it affects the outside. Um, now, in this passage we're about to read, I want you to know that it is not contradicting uh, what we talked about at the beginning of chapter 7 of the do not judge. Uh, instead of judging others, we are to told to be fruit inspectors. And I'm going to explain that as we go through this evening. We are told to be fruit inspectors. Uh, and in this particular case, in the passage that we're going to read, uh, we are to be fruit inspectors of those claiming to be prophets. Um, and it's very important that we must use the Bible to interpret itself. So we're going to read the passage and then spend some time exactly defining what is a prophet, what is a false prophet. Prophet. I think a lot of times our mentality of what a prophet is is different than what the biblical usage is. So join with me if you will. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Jesus continues his message by saying, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, I want to start right up front and give you some definitions of what a prophet is. We have a tendency to think of a prophet as just someone who tells future happenings of what's going to happen in the future, uh, whether it's next week or a hundred years. Uh, but a prophet, the, the, really the best definition of it is, it is a specific call and ministry on someone through whom God made known his word and himself to his people. That's why when we see Jesus do a miracle or he says something about God, people say, oh, he truly is a prophet. Uh, he is revealing something about the nature of God. He is revealing something to God's people. He is making God's word known to his people. And so prophecy also is just teaching God's word to people. Uh, it means both. It means foretelling future events or something that could happen. Um, but it also is just explaining God's word talking about God's word, or explaining who God is to his people. Therefore, a false prophet, a definition of a false prophet, it's very important to understand this, uh, is a deliberately deceptive person pretending to be a prophet. Um, it is to declare uh, a prophecy of explaining, again, a prophecy is to tell who God is, but 
Instead, they are declaring something other than who God says he is in his Bible. They are declaring something about God's word that is false. And it's very important to look at that deliberately. Um, it's very important to understand that this is a person who has a hidden agenda. And oftentimes, they may have a hidden agenda without knowing it. Um, they are operating on their own sinful behavior and what makes sense to them, or they are misusing God's word to paint themselves in a better light. But we'll get more into that as, as we go. Uh, so that's the definition of a prophet, a false prophet. And to declare a prophecy would be to declare who God is and what he is about. And it's, again, not always a future happening. However, there are that do declare future happenings. And the prophecy movement is a very large movement even today. Uh, there are some very strict scriptures on what happens if you declare a prophecy and it doesn't come true, uh, which tends to be forgotten by a lot of people who are speaking prophecy. Um, so it's, it's uh, if someone declares something is of God, this is of God and this is what will happen, and then it doesn't come true, uh, to put it softly, we shouldn't listen to that person anymore. So uh, we can think that, the other point that I want you to remember is that we can think that false teachers, and I'm gonna use false teachers and false prophets kind of interchangeably, uh, we can think that false teachers are only people who have positions of authority, when in reality, they can exist anywhere. Um, I've had churches where uh, someone was deliberately swaying their small group aside. Uh, I've worked in colleges where uh, one guy in particular swayed his dorm to uh, convince them that what he was saying was truth of college students, uh, and it was not. So we like to think that these false prophets are these guys who have all this money and fly on their own jets and uh, are almost announcing themselves as false prophets, when in reality there's always false prophets. There are always false teachers that exist anywhere. Now, especially at this time, this was a massive problem. Uh, the reason that people didn't always believe Jesus as a Messiah was there were several false messiahs. There were several people claiming to be Messiah from what we learn from history. In fact, uh, Barabbas, who they freed, was viewed as possibly a Messiah. The people really liked him. He led a revolt against the Romans, and that's what they wanted. Uh, the zealots were after. So uh, this was a massive problem at the time of Jesus. This was a massive problem when we see Paul's writings. A lot of Paul's writings are contradicting false teaching and false prophets who are coming in and saying that they are friends with Paul, but leading them to another gospel. And then the other thing to remember is that false teachers and false prophets still exist today. It is still a massive problem. Why? Because there are still humans. Humans have a tendency to want to promote themselves very clearly. So it was a massive problem in Jesus' day. It was a massive problem in Paul's day and today. And all the times in between, it's been a massive problem. So... <clears throat> Something that's interesting about today is a recent survey that was done found that people are more spiritually minded as a whole than ever before. Uh, we tend to think of that the world is lost or that doesn't pay attention to spiritual things, but in reality, everybody is looking for an answer. Uh, it doesn't mean it's correct. It doesn't mean, but people are buying into uh, so many different belief patterns or so many different areas of belief, and so many of them are false. Uh, think of what God says. Um, think of him, and specifically in John 17, verse 17, uh, Jesus is telling his disciples, we must sanctify them, set them apart by the truth. My word is truth. The only truth that we know is truth is Jesus' word. So when Jesus says something that powerful, that important, that only he is the, he is truth. It's not that he knows the truth, he is truth. Studying him is studying truth. When other falsities come up, uh, we can compare it to that one saying. Is it, does it match up with the word of God? So when we are told that we have to follow our own truth, uh, that is a massive false teaching. That is a a horrific false pattern of belief. We are to follow Jesus and his word. But I want to look back in the passage, the very first verse that we looked at, verse 15, watch out for false prophets. Then immediately he describes them as they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious prophets. 
wolf. So the first thing I want to look at is a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, it's important to tell you this, and I don't think I need to, but I have seen this happen before. Wolves very rarely announce that they are disguising themselves as a sheep to a flock of sheep. In other words, false teachers and, and false prophets don't normally come in and say, by the way, I am false and I am just looking to see what I can find. Uh, very often a, uh, a wolf is disguising itself very much on purpose. It wants to blend in. That's why it's disguising itself as a sheep. Because a wolf finds it very necessary to eat. A wolf is all about its appetite. It's how it survives. And it's not the only animal that does this, but the Bible specifically is talking about wolves. But a wolf will specifically, uh, let's just say in this instance, he put on a sheep costume. And the reason he did this is simple. He's looking to satisfy his own desires. He's not coming in because he wants what's best for the sheep. He's coming in because he wants what's best for himself. And this is a great way to eat is if he can disguise himself as a sheep and every night kill and devour a sheep and maintain his, maintain his disguise, he's doing a great thing and hunting has become way easier. So that's how we are picturing these false prophets. They come in, they blend in, they have their own agenda in their mind, but they're not telling anybody and they're doing what it takes to look like everyone else. The false prophet is doing whatever it is to satisfy its own craving. Um, so again, this wolf disguises itself to fit in with the community. The warning here is that a false prophet is not someone that you're going to be able to recognize right away. Um, he's dressed as a sheep, one to disguise the sheep, but also to, disguise, to camouflage himself to the shepherd. Um, he's also trying to fool the shepherd in this because he wants to take over the entire flock and consume them. And so the final battle will always come down, uh, not always, but most often will come down to the shepherd protecting the sheep from the wolf once he realizes what's going on. Um, so they're not going to howl like a wolf. They're not going to act like a wolf. They're going to ba like a sheep, and they're going to do whatever it is to try to blend in. So how do we, how do we now go against? How do we, how do we test these prophecies if you will. Well, I am so glad you asked because that's what the majority of the message is this evening. So let's look at testing the prophecies. Testing the prophecies. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 5. And this is really important. And it's a couple verses, but they're very short verses. Um, if you want to memorize a lot of verses, go to the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's verses like, rejoice always. Verse 16, uh, pray continually. Verse 17. And so we're going to look at starting in verse 19. And I wanted to, this is a very quick, this is not an exhaustive guide to how to find false prophets, but I think very important. Uh, starting in verse 19, Paul writes, Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So, I want to look at these verses by themselves. Uh, the first verse, 19. Um, and again, I want to say this as an overarching statement. I'm going to say this throughout, and especially more so next week. But the importance of your own personal study is of the utmost here. The time that you spend with God, as we have gone through the Sermon on the Mount, saying, how do you partake in His character? How do you know God, how do you know Jesus through his word? How do we live out? How do we commune? How do we fellowship? How do we pray? How do we fast? How do we rely on him? How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? And all of these things come through spending that undivided time with God. And so when it comes to testing the prophecies, when we study what is true, and uh, you may have heard the example of the Secret Service, the Secret Service who actually works more with money than they do of protecting political figures. They study the dollar bills all the time. They focus so much on what is true that when something false comes up, they know it right away. 
They don't spend that much time studying what's false. They study what is true. And how much more so, when we talk about this being the absolute truth, we must study the absolute truth so that we can recognize what is false as soon as it appears. So that's kind of my umbrella statement over all this. But then verse 19, do not quench the spirit. What is God revealing to you both to believe, to think, to meditate on, but also to practice in everyday life? That all comes through the Holy Spirit ministry in your life. It is why the Holy Spirit exists is to guide you, to teach you, to instruct you. And so when we quench the Holy Spirit, when we are not spending that time with God, communing with God in his word, praying, fasting, uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. We are quieting the teacher, if you will. We are blocking out what, it, what God specifically gave us to help us. So the biggest help that we're going to find is that time where the Holy Spirit is ministering to us. So what is God revealing to you through your time spent with him about what is being said or taught or um, set as an example by these false teachers. Uh, number two, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Uh, I had a friend who was unbelievably naive, and something I've learned about naive people is they seem to always believe what they shouldn't and never believe what they should. It's somehow it just got, and I, that's not scientific, this is just my observation, uh, but something gets switched somehow, and I wish I could reverse it, I'd make a lot of money. But somehow they always believe what they shouldn't and they never believe what they should. And I see that here is sometimes people come in and no matter who's teaching, they're always going to immediately look down on them. Uh, they treat prophecies or they treat teaching or they, they treat preaching, teaching, however you want to word that, with contempt. They immediately assume you're wrong and you have to prove yourself correct or you have to hopefully through the word of God, demonstrate what the truth is. So he's saying, don't come in with immediately already being turned off. You're listening to it with contempt. You're trying to find something that is wrong right from the get-go. But he is saying, but you should test them all. Um, so as a church, you should be testing what you hear me teach and preach. I am not here to fill in for God. Your time spent in church should be the launching point of your time spent with him throughout the week. This should not be your only time in God's word is at church. Um, you will, in a spiritual sense, starve yourself to death because you should be exercising or practicing what you are learning in the, your time with God throughout the week. And if you work out and practice and exercise all week long and you only eat one meal for, my messages are normally never longer than 15 minutes, and if that's all you're getting, you will spiritually starve to death. So time in God's word is so important. This should be a launching point, but it says test them all. When you are listening to the word of God and, and podcasts or watching TV or uh, messages online, whatever it is, including my own, test them all. You should be knowing the word of God and maturing and growing in your faith so that you can tell what is truth and what is not. But then he says, after you've tested them all, hold on to what is good. Uh, these are the truths that need to be applied to your life. Again, what you're listening to should be a launching point for your own personal study, your own personal time with God's word. word. And that is what you hunger and thirst after. Uh, the truths that reveal why God is to be worshipped first and most in our life. But then he says, reject every kind of evil. When you've tested it, you will know what is not truth. What is truth? Hold on to it. Hold on to it as if your life depended on it. But what is not true, reject it. And the picture I have of rejection here is what happens when your stomach doesn't like something? That type of rejection, that instantaneous. And the more you train yourself to know the truth, the easier it will become to reject something that is false, that is false teaching, that is false. Uh, I originally called this next part, Paul's Rules for Correct Prophecies. But I've actually switched it up. Some of it's Paul, but some of it's also John. So I want to tell you this part is the biblical rules for correct prophecies. Biblical rules for correct prophecies. And I want to emphasize this. This is not complete. This is just a starting point. Uh, in your uh, 
in your desire and hunger and thirsting for righteousness, for truth, this is the starting point to start for us with three very basic ones that uh, will start you on this path. Number one, it must be for the common good. It must be for the common good. Uh, when we think of some of the passages we just went over in Matthew, uh, when we say, um, do unto others what you would have them to do unto you, or when we say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and the second is like unto it, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. That is for the common good. It is to demonstrate, first and foremost, our love for God, and secondly, our love for the others. And what does Jesus say with both of those? On this hang all the laws and the prophets. So when we look at number one, it must be for the common good. Uh, you can't teach people evil and evil practices and things that are just not biblical and say that this is a biblical response. So it must be for the common good, which honors God first and foremost, and then demonstrates love to others. And uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 is a verse, but I actually want to look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 as we talk about this. Uh, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11, Paul is writing saying, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, and this is for the common good, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, one, it must be for the common good. It helps to build up the church. It is for everybody that will benefit in growing into Christ's likeness. Number two, very similar to this, it should build up the church. As we just read, that equipping, that word equip is so important to us at Hope Church. That's why we say love, equip, send. You'll see it on all of our t-shirts and everything. We love God, love others. We equip, we disciple so that we can do the things that God has called us to do. So it must be for the common good, number one. Number two, it should build up the church, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 5, uh, Romans 14, 19, Romans 15, 2, and even again that passage, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. That's one of the reasons I use that one to read through because it covers these. And then number three, it must agree with teachings in the Bible. Uh, very specifically in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, uh, it's not just the teachings of the Bible, but also specifically the teaching of the apostles. When the Bible was written, they didn't have the Bible like we do. And so it was the letters and it was the verbal teachings of the apostles that were going around starting these churches and discipling the early church leaders. He said, you cannot disagree with these specific people. Um, that's what a lot of false teachers were doing is they were twisting things, twisting things, twisting things. So uh, John writes in 1 John chapter 4, uh, 1 through 6, he writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Again, it is knowing God. It is knowing God's word. It is being able to tell and to discern what is from God and what is not from God. So now we get into the second part of this passage in Matthew. And this is what we've been talking about when we said the wide and the narrow gates and do not judge. And this is, I'm calling it, becoming a fruit inspector. Becoming a fruit inspector. Look at verse 20 in the passage that we are reading. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Jesus explains, good fruit can't come from bad trees. 
If you go up to a weed that is in your garden that has thorns all over it, and all of a sudden an orange is growing off of it, um, that's some kind of a record. That is something that's never happened before, and you've gotten a thorny briar or a thorny weed to produce good fruit. It just doesn't happen, even more so in the spiritual world. Something that is a, as it says, let's just read that passage, by their fruit, verse 16, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, in biblical times, the, some of these plants that you can still see, uh, from a distance, it looks like, oh, that's a fig. But as you get closer, it is a false fruit that isn't actually as big as a fig, and it's covered in thorns, and it's false. It looks like, from a distance, this is what it is, but it turns out it is false. And the same thing with um, figs and the other, um, any of those fruits. Now, the figs would have been something that would have been very important to that diet in that part of the world. That was a staple of their diet. And so Jesus is also kind of saying, like, here's something that's really important, but it's not true. It's false. And when you're really hungry and you think something uh, is something that it is not, you will run after it and be severely disappointed when you stick your hand in to grab it and you end up with a handful of thorns. So Jesus is saying, become a fruit inspector. Don't just run into something, stick your hand in, because it will have thorns and you will get hurt. And so he's saying, identify the fruit first. See the fruit. Know what they are doing. Uh, we talked last week on Galatians 5, 13 through 25. This is what happens when someone is living in the flesh. Uh, this is what happens if someone is living in the spirit. Uh, the fruits of the spirit as they've been called. So when somebody is teaching, when somebody is, is trying to come along and disciple you or lead you, um, we can tell if they're false or real by their fruits. What are they producing? Because some of these wolves in sheep clothing can even try to manufacture false fruit. But it is fake. So let's look. I love um, Luke's recording of the Sermon on the Mount, or not what we know in Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount, but again, we think this is something that Jesus probably taught regularly. Uh, Luke in chapter 6, starting in verse 43, has a very similar uh, message. He says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. Stop there. We as human beings, sinful natures, we cannot do good things. Everything we do apart from God is for our own pleasure, is for our, to make ourselves look great. Uh, we would say oftentimes, we're either trying to make God look awesome or ourselves look awesome, and we can't do both at the same time. So at our true nature, at our sinful heart, we always want to make ourselves look good. So what has to be stored up in our heart? The truth of God. The activity of the Holy Spirit needs to be at work in our hearts. So again, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So the first thing we want to do when we are uh, fruit inspecting is say, what are the fruits that we see from this person's life, from this man or woman's life? Are, are they demonstrating in action? Are they practicing what it is to bear fruit? Why? Well, the fruit always reveals the tree. If you came over to my house and I was like, hey, I have these beautiful six apple trees in my backyard. Uh, so if you buy my house, you will have a never ending crop of apples. And you're like, sounds good. So you do it because you just want apples that much. And then you realize I actually have six massive oak trees in my yard and they will never bear an apple. You should have looked closer because there are no apple trees as big as the oak trees in my yard. So the fruit will tell you what tree it is. Um, second, the quality of the fruit reveals the health of the tree. The quality of the fruit reveals the health of the tree. Uh, go back to John chapter 15. Before we started the Sermon on the Mount, we had David Barton come in and preach, and he preached on John 15. What does Jesus say? If you abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
the fruit that is produced can only be produced when it is correctly attached to the vine. When its source, going back to Psalms 1 that we looked at last week, when that tree is planted by the river, whatever is feeding that tree, that tree is the conduit for the fruit. It says a tree planted by that river of living water, that a tree that's roots go deep into who God is that feeds us, will bear its fruit in season, will always bear its fruit in season. John 15, the branch that is firmly connected into the vine of who Jesus is, that will produce healthy fruit. And John 15, Jesus says, and this fruit will last for eternity. The importance of spending time in God's word, the importance of being firmly uh, placed in that vine of who Jesus is and that life source of who he is and that picture of us, we are just... Um, this conduit of what God is doing through the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done because of God's unbelievable love for you and for me. So that's how we become a fruit inspector. We must be plugged into Jesus, plugged into his word. That is how we recognize bad fruit. That is how we recognize an unhealthy tree. And then lastly, these are just things that I've seen recently. Um, and I'm not being specific very much on purpose. Um, but when it comes to just identifying a false prophet, uh, these are things that I would say start here. Start with scripture, start with knowing God's word. But these are the things I'm seeing as very quick that should be red flags for you right away. Um, and again, this is after the stuff that we've already discussed. This is after it must be for the common good, that it should build up the church, that it must agree with the teachings of the Bible, um, that the fruit always reveals the tree, that healthy fruit comes from healthy trees. Um, so these are the things that I would say are red flags if you're sitting underneath uh, teaching of any kind. Uh, number one, if there is a lack of emphasis on the work of Jesus or the gospel, the gospel, the good news that Jesus defeated sin and death, that anyone that calls on him will be saved when we confess our sins. Anything that comes takes away from what Jesus has done and starts to say that they are playing an important role or taking away from Jesus or taking away from the gospel, run. That is a red flag. Um, if they are in any way uh, belittling what Jesus accomplished or how important the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Secondly, uh, if they act like the Bible is secondary or is of no use at all. Uh, there was a funny skit years ago and it was supposed to be this modern youth leader and he tells everybody, okay, raise your Bibles up in the air and say, this Bible is powerful and living and active and at my age it is too much for me to understand right now. Now put the Bibles under your chairs because you're not going to need those tonight. And it was ridiculous and it was funny. But unfortunately, I've sat in too many places where I never had to open my Bible. I never saw a passage used, um, and that is of no use. But then also that it is secondary. In other words, and I've mentioned this before, that they use the Bible as almost just like a band-aid. Uh, they use the Bible as just a basis for a um, motivative, motivating speech. And the actual of getting into God's word and realizing who God is and how powerful he is and the importance of Jesus and the gospel and the Holy Spirit and why we must spend time in God's word for ourselves and all that becomes secondary. That is a red flag. Uh, that is something that you should pay attention to. Um, and then third, if it is somebody who promotes themselves more than Jesus. Somebody that promotes themselves more than Jesus. I heard Craig Tug say recently, and I don't think it came from him, but I'm concerned about people who are more about their logo and their ego than they are about building the kingdom of God. And that stuck out to me. Uh, there are so many podcasts you can listen to and things about how to build the brand for you or how to build a brand for your church. And these are Christian things. And again, it's this balance of knowing like what's too far when you're trying to uh, build your logo or ego more than you are trying to build the kingdom of God. I've also heard it said to be careful of those who don't play well with others. Um, I've always said, uh, if you're looking for a church and you don't think Hope Church is a fit, I totally get it. Let us know. I can give you other churches to check out in the area. But also, if you go up to a pastor and say, hey, can you tell me other churches in the area? And they think their church is it, be very wary. That should be a red flag of, of somebody that doesn't play well with others, that isn't looking to build the unity, that isn't looking to build up the church as a whole, not just their own. Uh, a lot of times they are more interested in getting followers for themselves than they are of Jesus. And that is dangerous. 
Now I want to close with this. Look at verse 24 um, here in Matthew chapter 7, and we'll be in that in a couple of weeks. But chapter 7 verse 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. We've said it from the beginning and throughout this whole thing. The most important thing that you can do is spend personal time in God's word. Don't stop there. It says, and practices it. And exercises it. Why do we exercise? Why do we practice? Because we haven't figured it out yet. We have to practice it if we want to get better at something. So exercise, practice it. Um, lived out knowledge is the evidence of bearing fruit that lasts for eternity. This is how we bear fruit and, and how we are able to identify these bushes and brambles and wolves. We identify them by being able to spend time in God's word. We build our house on God's word. The true rock, Psalms mentions it as the rock so many times. But we also have to practice it. Spending time in God's word and practice it. You cannot know Jesus without knowing his word. The word literally means that the Bible is God's breath, that it is God inspired, that he breathes out these words that are his words to us. And John 1 tells us that Jesus is the word of God, that we know God by knowing Jesus and that we know Jesus by studying what he has given us in his word and not quenching the Holy Spirit as it teach, instructs, disciples, leads, and guides us. We know God by knowing Jesus and we know Jesus by knowing God's word. Hope Church, please let us know. If you're watching this and you have never put your faith in him, if you have never believed that Jesus is who he says he is and called out for him to be your savior and leader of your life, I would beg you to do that now, meaning it from your heart. But if you are a follower of Christ, the question comes back, something we've been asking all along, what is your personal time in God's word? How are you communing and fellowshipping with him? What needs to get put on your schedule? What alarms need to be set on your phone? What are the things that you can do differently this week as you grow, as you hunger and thirst for righteousness, as you want the Holy Spirit to transform you into who Jesus wants you to be, more like him? Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you so much for who you are, your power, your word, the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that we would be attentive to what you are teaching us. That we would understand the importance of spending time with you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.